When it comes to the decision as to whether or not to create a new product or service, the very first question you should start with is, does this solve a problem? Popping on a west side, cause it's why I stay. I just made a thousand, blew it in your face. I've been going in, oh, I'ma close the case. I can't wait no more, man, I got it blow today. Popping on a west side, cause it's why I stay. I just made a thousand, blew it in your face. I've been going in, oh, I'ma close the case. If your product or service solves a problem, the likelihood that you can sell it and get some kind of profit out of it is remarkably higher. So not only do good products and services solve problems, your solution to the problem is what's creating value in your business. Now, if the problem you're solving isn't inherently valuable when it comes to the solution, you may have a hard time selling whatever it is that you're trying to launch. It's one of the great things about a software business is it's extremely scalable. We you know, can just add more and more customers and it just works. You know, in the past, I've had businesses that are very labor intensive. You got to hire people to perform the work and that makes it much harder to scale. I don't think I'm super scalable. I do believe uh, that I have developed systems to help me uh, bring on more and more clients to make it more and more profitable. But I don't see myself going as a, you know, 500 employee, maybe an IPO type thing. I'm just not there for this particular venture. Our actual construction business is not very scalable unless you have massive amounts of more tools, manpower, uh, and bookkeeping power, and you have a lot of people that know what they're doing. On the other hand, our YouTube business is very scalable. It really just depends how many people are watching, and you can actually just get better paying ads and make more money on your YouTube, um, Google Click ads, and all that kind of stuff. It really is the most scalable type of business I've ever been in where you don't have to do much extra work to generate two to three times the income. It's pretty amazing, actually. If my mentor was here, he would tell me to never try to create a service-based agency. It's a very complicated system. I see now as I'm trying to grow and scale a, uh, a service-based business and learning that at the core of that is learning people and managing people, I see now why investors, why uh, founders, why creators are so focused on software as a service because um, it's way easier to scale. So I would say on a scale of uh, one to hard, we're at hard. I'll piggyback on that though because while it's really hard to scale um, a service-based business like mine, uh, Amazon Expertise, it also is our greatest advantage in regards to competition. So what I mean by that is as all the other agencies get money behind them as they all try to scale, um, you can't necessarily scale expertise at a high level. If so, these brands wouldn't need us in the first place because Amazon would have already automated everything and scaled it out. So um, the difficulty to entry to being a scaled Amazon team is I think our greatest asset. So. Now we have the product side, which is very scalable. Uh, right now, you know, when I go to the manufacturer, we're usually getting several hundred bottles at a time. Uh, I like to keep our batches uh, smaller. However, I could go to my manufacturer tomorrow and say I need 10,000 units by the end of the week and that wouldn't be a huge stretch. So we can scale uh, for our product very quickly. With our service, not so much. Uh, you know, it's kind of spread pretty thin with how much time you have to be out making deliveries personally. Um, you know, and I'd say on a on a on a daily basis, it's it's an hour or more that I'm spending in the car, driving around and making our deliveries. And so that part of our business would not be very scalable. How do we bring the cost down? Uh, a couple different ways. One was to offshore the work, right? So the taking advantage of the currency rates, uh, the same quality of work here in the US is gonna cost me more than if I used uh, somebody in the Philippines who has an equal uh, skill level. So using a VA has been one of the ways that I, I'm able to bring down the cost of producing the content. Uh, and another way is just efficiency with processes. Um, so, you know, finding efficiencies and processes, like a system in place, will save you a lot of time, energy, and money. So, 
Uh, that is how I try to bring the cost down by being efficient in my process as well as uh, using VAs to uh, supplement the workload versus you know, hiring here in the US is just too expensive, sorry. The best way we found to bring down the cost of, of building homes actually is to do most of the things ourselves, And that's because there's not as, as many mistakes made. Uh, we don't have to go back and fix things as often. And I'll give you for an example here, the house that's getting constructed next to the one we're building, it's a contractor, he's subbing everything out. Guys come in and do the footings, they do the foundation, homeowner shows up, you know what? They built the whole thing the wrong size. Like the whole foundation and wall and slab and everything is not the right size. It's like way smaller <laughs> than it was supposed to have been. That's gonna cost somebody a lot of money, probably the contractor. So we try to avoid huge pitfalls in money by just being on top of it, like being on the job, doing a lot of things ourselves. Sheer quantity is always going to get you a discount or a better price. Now, you really have to figure out whether that's a smart choice or not. When you're starting out, I do not recommend you go out there and buy 10,000 labels for a product that you don't know if you're gonna wanna change right off the bat, right? If you're still at trying to find that MVP and um, you know working through some product development, do not go out and buy 10,000 labels. Um, I've made the mistake of buying too much at first and then you end up changing something on uh, your ingredients or you don't like the look of something on, on your product label and you got to restart. So buying a bulk can help, but understand that you have an established product before you do so. You know, there's all kinds of things you can do almost from like product creation to selling it that really makes the cost of the product cheaper. And it's just kind of about figuring out where those areas are high and then um, finding which ones are non-negotiable as well. Like you don't ever want to lose quali quality or sacrifice quality for that. So it's finding those areas um, and then going in going in on that. So, you know, I'm buying some small e-commerce brands right now and that's definitely what I'm doing. I'm looking at every every part of the chain from manufacturing to um, arriving at the customer's door and looking at all of my costs along the way um, for that product. And, um, you know, whether it's logistics, whether it's, uh, you know, fulfillment, whether it's uh, pricing, whether it's discounts, whether it's uh, saving money on on less by having less returns or um, shrinkage or you know there's a million things to look at but those are all ways to cut costs and and increase profitability so if you're cutting costs in one area sometimes you can pass that on to the customer and lower the price um, in other ways it's profit going right back into the bank and if that's the case I'm, I'm almost always pushing the people I help them save money in one area to reinvest that into advertising because the advertising gives us the data the data helps us sell more stuff. It's all cyclical. And uh, that's, that's the Amazon flywheel explained in about two seconds. Popping on a west side, cause it's why I stay. I just made a thousand, blew it in your face. I've been going in, uh, I'ma close the case. I can't wait no more, man, I gotta blow the day. Popping on a west side, cause it's why I stay. I just made a thousand,